For over 100 years, teams in the NFL have worked countless hours day in and day out to try and cement their team's legacy in the history books of the NFL. Many teams have found great success in this venture, while others are still working towards the ultimate goal of being Super Bowl champions. Of the teams that have yet to hoist the illustrious Lombardi Trophy, none have had a more peculiar list of downfalls, disappointments, or damaging occurrences that have kept them from winning the big game than the Minnesota Vikings. Today we'll be going through the team's history decade by decade, starting with the very beginning. Many of you may not be aware, but the Vikings weren't the first NFL franchise that came out of the state of Minnesota. They weren't even the second. The first team from Minnesota that played in the NFL, before it was even called the NFL, was the Minneapolis Marines, who played in the American Pro Football Association from 1921 to 1925. Duluth was the second city to form a team, when they joined the league in 1923 as the Duluth Kellys, where they played until 1927 when they swiftly left the league. Minnesota was then without a professional football team until 1961, when the Minnesota Vikings were formed. The team got its name from their first GM, Burt Rose, who called the team the Vikings to honor the Nordic tradition that was prominent in the northern Midwest. This also marked the first time in league history that a team used a region in the team name instead of the city that they played out of. Just like every other team in the league, before their first season, they had to build their team, which was assisted greatly when they were granted the first overall pick in the NFL draft, where they proceeded to take Tommy Mason, a running back out of Tulane. The team also picked up their first and possibly most notable QB in franchise history, Fran Tarkenton out of Georgia in the third round. The team's inaugural season in 1961 started off strong, with a convincing 37-13 win against the Chicago Bears. Unfortunately, this promising start would be very short-lived, as the team only won two more games the rest of the season, ending the season with a 3-11 record. The majority of the rest of the 1960s would go quite poorly for the Vikings, as they only managed to amass a record of 32-59-7 in their first seven seasons, with only one winning season coming in 1964. Luckily for the Vikings, the late 60s would be a major turning point for the team, and would be the start of one of the greatest dynasties that the league has ever seen. The team made the slightly puzzling decision to trade away Fran Tarkenton in 1967 for two first-round picks and two second-round picks, leaving the team in the hands of newly acquired CFL quarterback Joe Cap and CFL head coach Bud Grant, who took over for Norm Van Brocklin. The first season with Cap and Grant in 1967 did not go particularly well, with the team going 3-8-3. Luckily, for Grant and the rest of the Vikings team, 1968 marked the emergence of one of the greatest defenses the league has ever seen, led by the Purple People Leaders. Alan Page, Gary Larson, Carl Eller, and Jim Marshall. These four men, together, made up one of the most formidable defensive lines in NFL history, compared to groups like the Steel Curtain and the Fearsome Foursome. This group was the cornerstone of the Minnesota Vikings from the late 60s to the late 70s. With the emergence of such a dangerous group, the Vikings were able to acquire their first playoff berth in 1968 after winning their first division championship. The following season in 1969, the team dominated opposing teams, putting up a 12-2 record. The team managed to make it to the last pre-merger NFL championship game, where they easily beat the Cleveland Browns 27-7. This was a great way for the team to end off the first decade of their existence. Unfortunately, the 1970s would start off with giving the team and its fans a sour taste that would soon become all too familiar. The Super Bowl was still a relatively new concept in 1970, and after beating the Browns to finish off the decade of the 60s, the Vikings earned the right to face off against the Kansas City Chiefs in Super Bowl IV. Unfortunately, this is where the current legacy of the Minnesota Vikings would start to take place, as Kansas City was able to pull off a major upset, beating the Vikings 23-7. Even after a gut-wrenching outcome in their first Super Bowl appearance, the Vikings continued to utilize their punishing defense led by the Purple People Eaters to lead them to consecutive playoff appearances to start off the 1970s. Both 1970 and 1971 ended in early playoff exits in the divisional rounds. The team then recognized after their consecutive exits that they were missing something, which led them to trade away a plethora of players and picks to get Fran Tarkenton back from the Giants. This wasn't quite enough, though, as the team finished with a 7-7 record. To further address issues with the team, they drafted running back Chuck Foreman with their first pick in the 1973 draft. It seemed that the team had finally put all the pieces together, a historically great defense, a top-tier quarterback, and a promising young running back who was only getting better with time. It's safe to say that these pieces melded together better than anyone could have expected, as the team proceeded to go to Super Bowls in consecutive seasons. 
On the downside, the Vikings were not able to punch the final winning ticket in either game, further adding to their future reputation of mediocrity and disappointment. After losing Super Bowl VIII against the Miami Dolphins 24-7, as well as Super Bowl IX against the Pittsburgh Steelers 16-6, fans thought that it couldn't get much more frustrating. But they were quickly proven wrong. In 1975, the year following the Vikings' third Super Bowl loss, the team started off in dominating fashion, winning the first 10 games of the season while easily taking home another NFC Central Division title. This time around, they met the Dallas Cowboys in the divisional round, the same team that knocked them out of the divisional round in the 1971 playoffs. They would do the same thing this time around, but in a slightly different fashion. Folks, this play you're about to see is widely considered as the first Hail Mary in NFL history. He is going to coach. Drew Fairstein. He got it. Touchdown. I didn't know they had it for That's right. Hall of Fame QB Roger Starbuck and wide receiver Drew Pearson connected for that 50-yard bomb to kick the hopeful Vikings out of the 1975 playoffs. This is also considered by many to be the first of many fail Marys in league history. I'd go more in depth, but we have a lot to talk about, so let's move on. Two years after that illustrious play and multiple years after painful consecutive Super Bowl losses, fans were sure that a team this good had to be able to produce some type of promising memory for the team and state of Minnesota. They were very wrong, as the team managed to make it to their fourth Super Bowl of the 70s in 1977, where they received a thorough ass whooping from the Raiders, losing the game 32 14. After two more consecutive playoff appearances in 78 and 79, the team started to slow down and lose their dominating swagger. Fran Tarkenton retired following the 1978 season, leading the Vikings to search for their next signal caller. This is where the team would turn to Tommy Kramer for the final run of the 70s and a healthy portion of the 80s. More changes were also on the horizon, as the year 1979 marked the beginning of the construction of the Herbert H. Humphrey Metrodome, the future home of the Minnesota Vikings. It was clear to see that this was a different team over the course of the 1980s, as the team only won the NFC Central Division two total times, which isn't exactly what fans were expecting, considering what they had watched transpire over the last 10 years. Luckily for them, the team was able to make it on three other occasions as one of the wildcard teams in the playoffs. The decade also never gave fans that sweet, sweet excitement of being in the Super Bowl that they had tasted four separate times during the last decade. But that didn't mean that there wasn't some major disappointment along the way from their favorite team. But let's take a look at one of the only bright spots from the 1980s for the Minnesota Vikings. December 14th of 1980 marked one of the greatest last second drives that any team in history has put together. The score was 23-22 in favor of the Cleveland Browns, who earlier led the game by a score of 23-9. After 13 unanswered points scored by Tommy Kramer and the Vikings, with some interception help along the way, the Vikings were given one last chance. With 14 seconds, no timeouts, and the ball on their own 14-yard line, all hope looked as if it was lost for the team who had come roaring back. Instead of boringly telling you how this all went down, we'll just let you watch and listen to the two greatest plays that the NFL has ever seen in conjunction. That really happened. This game has since been known as the Miracle at the Met. Now let's check back into reality and look at one of the more disappointing games in team history. The 1987 NFC Championship game pitted the Minnesota Vikings versus the Washington Redskins. This was a game that, while low scoring, provided one of the more painful moments in team history for the Minnesota Vikings. The score was 17-10 in favor of the Redskins, but the Vikings had driven the ball all the way down to the Redskins' 6-yard line. On a fourth down and four, Wade Wilson was given the snap, dropped back, and took his shot towards the end zone. I'll let you watch what happened from here. Nelson. That drop from Darren Nelson turned the ball over on downs and allowed the Redskins to run out the rest of the clock, putting the final dagger through the collective heart of Minnesota, as the Super Bowl hopes of the Vikings were dashed once again. And while Nelson may not have scored when he had caught the ball, it certainly would have been a first down which leaves nearly every fan wondering, what if? 
Aside from a couple more early playoff exits from the Minnesota Vikings, the 1980s didn't have much to offer for fans as far as positive, memorable moments, especially considering the trade that the team made on October 12, 1989 to get what they hoped would be their next great running back. Herschel Walker. At the time, he was a fourth-year player that had rushed for over 1,500 yards as a previous season with seven total touchdowns. The Vikings gave up damn near everything they had to get this man. In the trade, the Vikings received Herschel Walker, two third-round picks, a fifth-round pick, and tenth-round pick. In return, the Cowboys received a total of five current players, three first-round picks, three second-round picks, a third-round pick, and a sixth-round pick. Many consider this to be one of the most lopsided and worst trades in NFL history considering how everything panned out on both sides. Herschel Walker never got anywhere close to what the Vikings and the rest of the league expected him to be. And the Cowboys? Well, we'll come back to them when we get to the 90s. Oh, would you look at that? We're in the 90s. That was quick. Remember those Cowboys that we were talking about just a second ago? Yeah? Well, I should probably mention that two of those draft picks that the Vikings gave up to get Herschel Walker turned into Emmitt Smith and Darren Woodson. Woodson, the less notable of the two, was a stud at safety, making the Pro Bowl five times and being named First Team All-Pro four separate times. Emmett Smith, on the other hand, was just okay. That is if you consider being the NFL's all-time leader in rushing yards, making eight Pro Bowls, being First Team All-Pro four times in four consecutive years, Second Team All-Pro twice, winning Offensive Rookie of the Year in his rookie season, and then League MVP later in his career to be just okay? Then yeah, he was just okay. Let me also acknowledge that over the course of the 90s, the Dallas Cowboys went on to build a dynasty and win three Super Bowls. The Vikings, on the other hand, only won the division three times, never making it to a Super Bowl, even during the 1998 season. Now, what makes 1998 so special? Let me explain. With the 21st selection in the 1998 NFL Draft, the Minnesota Vikings unknowingly drafted what would be one of the greatest wide receivers that would ever catch a football, Randy Moss out of Marshall being paired up with future fellow Hall of Fame wide receiver Chris Carter and having veteran Randall Cunningham throw to them would create some of the most lethal offensive attacks that the league has ever seen. Moss put up numbers like the league had never seen before, posting 69 receptions, 1,313 yards, and a league-leading 17 touchdowns as a rookie. He had one of the most dominant performances by any player on Thanksgiving that season, putting up three receptions for 153 yards and three touchdowns. Every single time this man touched the ball that day, he put up six points. That moment is what truly put Moss on the map. The Vikings offense would go on to put up a total of 556 points, which was the most in league history until 2007. The team would also go on to be the third team ever to win 15 games in the regular season, posting a record of 15-1, only losing to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers by three points, and eventually making it all the way to the NFC Championship game against the Atlanta Falcons. This is where one of the most heart-shredding moments in team history came into fruition. The 1998 NFC Championship game, the sixth one in team history for the Vikings. While the majority of the game provided memorable and anxiety-inducing moments for both teams, we're going to fast forward to 2 minutes and 11 seconds left in the fourth quarter. The Vikings had just had an incomplete pass on third down and lined up for a 39-yard field goal that would give the Vikings a 10-point lead and a 95.23 chance at winning the game. A trip to the team's fifth Super Bowl was put on the foot of stud place kicker Gary Anderson, who entered that situation having gone 35 of 35 field goals made during the regular season, which was the first time in NFL history that a kicker had not missed a single field goal. It seemed like a sure thing. Fans believed that this would be the end of continual disappointment brought on by this franchise. Now I'll just let this play out for you. Do you think Gary Anderson will... Make this field goal, the answer should probably be yes. 39 yards away, and it's not good. The Falcons have one timeout. They have the ball as Anderson misses. Now, whether it was the pressure of the situation or John Madden jinxing the hell out of Anderson, fans were disappointed to a whole new level. This allowed the Falcons a chance to drive down the field and tie the game, which is exactly what they did. The game went into overtime, where the Falcons proceeded to drive down the field and win the game via the foot of their own Anderson, Morton Anderson. The Falcons pulled off the upset against one of the greatest teams that never won a Super Bowl in NFL history. Just when fans thought that the tides would turn in their favor, the football gods had other plans. That moment would put a taste as sour as pure malic acid in the taste of every fan, player, and coach of the Vikings. Of all the things that could have been exciting over the course of the 90s, this is the last thing that anyone wanted. 
even with the Rookie of the Year in Randy Moss and the Coach of the Year in Denny Green, the team couldn't get it done when it mattered most. The 2000s were a new millennium and a new decade with new hopes for the Minnesota Vikings and their fans. Those new hopes would quickly be flushed down the metaphorical football toilet bowl. In the final full season with head coach Dennis Green, the Vikings bounced back with an 11-5 record and ended up punching their 7th ticket to the NFC Championship game in team history against the 12-4 New York Giants led by Kerry Collins, Tiki Barber, and the anchor of future Hall of Fame defensive end Michael Strahan. Folks, you may want to firmly sit in whatever seat you're in right now because this one hurts on a whole new level. The Vikings would go on to embarrass themselves in front of the entire football world, putting up no sort of fight and losing the NFC Championship by an abysmal score of 41-0. At this point, fans wondered if things would ever turn around for the better, and for a while, it seemed like the answer was no. The team wouldn't win the NFC North division again until the 2008 season, one year after drafting arguably one of the greatest players in the history of the franchise. With the seventh pick in the 2007 NFL Draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Adrian Peterson, running back, Oklahoma. Adrian Peterson was the number one running back in the country in his high school class, a running back with speed, power, agility, and overall athleticism that hadn't been seen by NFL scouts since guys like Bo Jackson, Jim Brown, and some of the game's greatest runners. Peterson would go on to easily win the Rookie of the Year in 2007 and helped in leading the team to their first divisional title since 2000 in the year 2008. But the Philadelphia Eagles quickly said no sir, giving the Vikings an early wild card exit. The Vikings had one more shot to make it to the big game in the first decade of the new millennium. They had nearly every piece to be able to do damage. A top-ranked defense, a solid offensive line, one of the best running backs in the league, and multiple weapons at wide receiver and tight end. The only thing truly missing from this puzzle was a top-tier quarterback. That's exactly what the front office noticed, and they proceeded to make one of the craziest NFL free agency moves the league had ever seen. After going through his second attempt at retiring from the NFL, future Hall of Fame quarterback and public enemy number one among Vikings fans for nearly the last two decades, Brett Favre gave the league one last shot with the team that he had punished for so many years. It became immediately apparent that this is what the Vikings needed to truly be Super Bowl contenders, as Favre would go on to have one of his greatest statistical seasons of his storied career, putting up numbers that were absolutely astronomical for a guy playing NFL football at his age of 40. He provided fans with moments that they will never forget, both in the regular season the game, Niners lead by four. Barb back to pass, pumps to the left, eight seconds left. He gets away from the pressure, fires to the end zone. It's caught! It's Greg Lewis! Touchdown! Oh my heavens! Greg Lewis, welcome to Minnesota! And the postseason. Play a lot of ways. I mean, they're able to get so much pressure with their front four, they don't have to bring extra people. Barb lets it go, downfield, pass caught! Touchdown, Rice! He, along with the still-dominant Adrian Peterson and the Vikings defense, would lead the team to their 8th NFC Championship against the formidable New Orleans Saints. This is where things got interesting. While the Saints were favored by 4, the Vikings managed to keep the game close, despite a plethora of fumbles by multiple players and a nearly constant beatdown of Brett Favre by the Saints defense, who would eventually get caught for having a bounty system put in place by Saints defensive coordinator Greg Williams that would pay players extra money for intentionally injuring opposing players. This resulted in mass suspensions as well as court hearings and litigation. But back to the game. With the game tied 28-28 and the clock winding down on the final quarter, Favre and the Vikings were driving down the field and looked to be in prime position to set up the game-winning field goal that would send them to their fifth Super Bowl in team history. But of course, that would be too nice of a thing for fans to go through. This is how things actually played out. Favre sprints to his right, throws back across the middle, and he's intercepted. Porter. The return by Porter, and he's brought down with seven seconds left. After such a historic season with memories that will stick with fans' heads for the rest of their lives, this one will stick more than anything else. What a way to end the first decade of the new millennium. As if things couldn't get any worse for the team and its fans, the 2010 started off on quite the negative note. 
A 6-10 record after nearly punching a ticket to the Super Bowl will leave a sour taste in anyone's mouth. You know what's worse? Yeah, that's pretty bad. This was the fifth different occasion that the Metrodome had collapsed, which forced the Vikings to play the rest of their home games in TCF Bank Stadium, the home of the Minnesota Gophers. Now the old saying goes, adding insult to injury, but in the case of Brett Favre, this was definitely a case of adding injury to insult. After putting up quite lackluster numbers for the majority of the season, even with the newly reacquired Randy Moss, Favre played his last snap in the Week 15 Monday Night Football matchup against the Chicago Bears after getting his head slammed into the frozen turf of TCF Bank Stadium on a sack. This was certainly a poor way to start off the 2010s. Some argue that 2011 may have been worse. At this point, Adrian Peterson was one of the few bright sides of the team, as he continued to make opposing defenses look like high schoolers week in and week out. Even then, the team ended up posting a horrific record that landed them the number 3 pick in the next NFL draft where they proceeded to make one of the poorer choices in team draft history when they took Matt Khalil out of USC, who truly never panned out. But even worse, on Christmas Eve of 2011, Adrian Peterson would be given a very, very poor present. And here goes Adrian Peterson. Good ankle tackle. Checking the statistics here as Peterson is slow to get up and in the first half, boy, that is a painful Peterson. A torn ACL. How nice. And with it being that late in the season, no one gave him a shot in hell of being ready in time for the start of the 2012 season. Adrian Peterson did everything he could to rehab as quickly as possible to be ready for some sort of comeback. And boy did he come back. The man was a certified freak of nature at this point. This shouldn't have been possible for anyone. But this man wasn't just anyone. Just look at the numbers this man is putting up. He was 9 yards away from breaking the single season rushing record held by Eric Dickerson, right after one of the worst injuries that players regularly get. Even with the horrid 2B play of second year quarterback Christian Ponder, Peterson single handedly put the team on his back and led them to the playoffs. Unfortunately, that would be the brightest the season would get, as Peterson alone would not be enough to beat Green Bay in the wild card that year, ending one of the single greatest seasons that the league had ever seen. And yes, he obviously won Comeback Player of the Year, along with the MVP award. Not until 2015 would the team make it back to the playoffs after winning the division with an 11-5 record. They would face off against the Seattle Seahawks in the wildcard round. This game was absolutely frigid, with very little scoring being done on either side. But the Vikings still had a shot. Now, does that mean that they ended up pulling it off? Come on now, you know exactly where this is going. With all that this team and its fans had gone through since 1961, this was certainly the time for things to go the Vikings' way, especially with one of the best young kickers in the league, Blair Walsh, lining up for a true chip shot to give the Vikings the lead and eventual win. It was only 27 yards. Super easy. Blair Walsh from 27 yards left hash. Snap good, spot down, Walsh's kick is up, and it is no good, he missed it! Are you kidding me? The season can't end like that! He missed it left! And the Seattle Seahawks are off to Charlotte. Damn it. We need to stop saying the things will go our way just because of how bad the past has been. Again, fans wondered why in the world this kind of stuff keeps happening to them. It seemed like things would actually never turn around. But have no fear, the 2017 season is kind of here. After a dominating opening game win in week one against the New Orleans Saints, the Vikings and quarterback Sam Bradford were feeling good about the young season. Those good feelings would quickly vanish, as Bradford would be sidelined indefinitely with yet another injury, adding on to the massive list that he had already had in his career. The following week, the Vikings were completely outplayed by the Steelers, as career journeyman quarterback Case Keenum would struggle to find a rhythm against the solid Pittsburgh defense. As if losing your quarterback wasn't difficult enough to work with, matters were made worse when young stud running back Dalvin Cook would go down with a season-ending ACL tear injury in Week 4 against the Detroit Lions. Now, sitting at 2-2, two and two, with the two most important pieces of the offense out for the foreseeable future, the Vikings and their fans wondered what the point was in watching the team. That's when Case Keenum and the Vikings would turn things around. This was the definition of a Cinderella run for the Vikings, 
who, led by what looked like the second coming of the Purple People Eaters, as well as a top wide receiver duo in Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs, would go on to win 11 of the team's final 12 regular season games. This would earn them their 20th division title, the number two seed in the NFC playoffs, and a first round playoff bye. The Vikings would go on to meet the Saints in the divisional round of the playoffs, which would provide one of the single greatest moments in the history of the NFL. After dominating and leading the Saints 17-0 at halftime, the Saints would mark one of the greatest almost comebacks in NFL playoff history. The Saints would drive down the field toward the end of the game, lining up the go-ahead field goal for Will Lutz. The man did drill the kick, making the score 24-23 in favor of the Saints. This would give the Vikings 25 seconds to try and march down the field, starting at their own 25-yard line to try and give kicker Kai Forbath one more chance. But things transpired a bit differently than expected. After consecutive incomplete passes, the Vikings were stuck with 10 seconds left on their own 39-yard line. There was absolutely no shot. Marshawn Lattimore, 12 yards from Adam. Case on a deep drop, steps up in the pocket. He'll fire to the right side, caught by Diggs. Stay oh, my God. oh my God! Oh my God! 30, no 10, way. touchdown! Oh. Are you kidding me? The finish! It's a Minneapolis miracle! Step on Diggs! And the Minnesota Vikings have walked up on the New Orleans Saints. It's a 61-yard Minneapolis miracle. Oh, well, would you look at that? I guess I lied. Let's see it from one more chilling angle. That play would be forever known as the Minneapolis Miracle, and would lead the Vikings to the NFC Championship game against the Philadelphia Eagles. And this one meant way more than any other NFC Championship, due to the fact that if the Vikings were to win and move on to the Super Bowl, they'd be the first team to ever host the Super Bowl in their home stadium. The game would start off great, but right about there is where the great start would end. More pain, more suffering and a result that Vikings fans will have to hear about and endure until the team can actually win the big game. After that day, the Vikings knew that they were close to being able to compete year after year with the best that the NFL had to offer, so they decided to go and get what they thought was the last piece of the puzzle. Signing Kirk Cousins, along with all the other moves that the front office has made since that game, hasn't amounted to much besides one playoff appearance and many more angry fans. At this point, the 2010s couldn't have ended sooner. And after all that, that leads us to where we are now, the 2020s, the decade where everyone expected flying cars and robot servants to be around. The Vikings team is currently one of the youngest in the league, full of star potential with players like Justin Jefferson, Jeff Gladney, Cameron Dantzler, and many other guys in their first or second season that are hopefully on their way to being something special and doing something special. That's something special? Bringing a football championship to the state that loves their team dearly, but is tired of the pain and the suffering. All they want is that Lombardi trophy.